so for manuscript submission, um, the cover letter is very important. It needs to be concise. It should never be more than one page. And be sure to revise your cover letter if you send it to a different journal. Dear Dr. Smith, I'm sure my paper is perfect for your journal, Nature Cell Biology, because, and I'm, you know, that doesn't put me in a good mood. And you don't want to be in a bad mood when I decide what to do with a paper. So, you know, don't, you know, revise the cover letter. It's not that hard to make sure it's the right cover letter for the right journal. Um, make sure you have a certification and statement of what the contributions were of all the authors. Most journals require that. It's important um, if the most software for journals now gives you a place to actually suggest reviewers and gives you a place to um, reject to ask that some reviewers not be used. It's important to suggest reviewers, especially if you're doing something that pulls together some diverse technologies that maybe your average hematologist or editor for a journal wouldn't actually know a lot about. So if you're doing mathematical modeling or you're doing um, you know, some kind of very electrophysiology, you know, something that, that is not you know, kind of standard hematology, if you're going to a place like blood, I mean, suggest reviewers that might actually do to help review with that part of the paper. In terms of excluding paper reviewers, um, you know, if you exclude more than two, two or three reviewers, you just sound paranoid. And I mean, I'm, literally, we get papers where there can, there be 15 people listed that they don't want their paper to go to, and they've listed every person in the world that's working on the topic because, oh my God, they might be competitors. No, you exclude people that you were recently divorced from. You exclude, <laughs> you exclude people that you're in a lawsuit with. You exclude people that you really have a direct personal conflict with, or possibly in a very small area that you know that you and they are working on something you know, competitively and you, know, you don't want to leave it to chance that somehow they're not going to do the right thing when they review your paper. But other than that, you know, the fact that somebody might in five years work in the same area is not a reason to exclude that reviewer. And don't suggest reviewers because they used to share a lab with you, or they were your mentor, or they're from the same country as you. I'm really astounded when people suggest reviewers, you know, on platelets when the paper is actually on, I don't know, leukemia. And it's like, why would they suggest? It just makes them look, you know, it just makes you look kind of stupid and, and clueless. And it turns out they're, oh, they were at the same institution. That's why they suggested them. That's not a very, you know, not a very good reason. Um, you know, if you are need unpublished data that you refer to in your paper, like there's a companion, not a companion paper, but a paper that's gone to another journal that's in revision or, you know, is accepted but not impressed yet. If the, auth if the reviewers need to have access to that to understand your paper and you reference it in your paper, then you need to include a preprint or a PDF or something as supplementary information with the paper, because otherwise it's going to delay the process. You know, three weeks later, the reviewer is going to say, wait a minute, I, you know, how can I review the paper without access to what they actually did in terms of publishing the method? And you know, then they have to call the editor, and then the editor has to call you, and it can really delay the process. So you know, make that information um, available up front, and make sure the geo link works, because there's nothing that pisses off reviewers more is when they're looking at a gene expression study, and they can't actually get access to the primary data to see if it you know, actually works. Um, so make sure the geo link works. If the paper is rejected, you know, first of all, never, never send the editor an angry email in less than 24 hours. I've gotten. I wouldn't exactly call them death threats, but I've certainly had things said to me that, um, you know, that I wouldn't want to meet the person in a dark alley. So wait 24 hours, calm down. You know, it is like your child. I understand when you have a paper rejected, it's like somebody saying your baby, you know, really isn't good enough. Um, but that happens. And look at the rejection, look at the reviewer comments, and decide if it was rejected based on justifiable problems with your paper that even you admit, well then stop, fix those problems and go on to another journal. Accept the decision if it said it's based on priority and novelty. I mean, it doesn't matter how good the work is if the reviewers and the editor said that this is solid work but it just doesn't excite me and you know, it's a high a journal that you know, only accepts 20% of the papers that are submitted, then you just need to go somewhere else. The only time you should consider a rebuttal is if the reviewers really missed a major facet of what you did. If they have an error of fact in their review. If the review says, you know, this paper from five years ago already did this, and it turns out they didn't, that that paper was actually in a mouse and you're doing human, or it's a different pathway they didn't understand. 
or if they just are plain wrong, then it's reasonable to go back to the editor and say, this was wrong. And then they'll look at it again, and they may change their decision. But you know, if it just wasn't important enough or interesting enough, you're probably not going to change their mind. When you send an appeal, like I said, wait 24 hours. Don't use any bad words. Um, be unemotional. Be polite. Be succinct and clear. Um, and wait at least a week for a response from the editor before you send it to another journal. It's really annoying when you go through a whole process of looking into something and talking to the associate editor and deciding, OK, we made a mistake. Then you email the author back and they say, oh, sorry, we already submitted it to blank. Well, then why did you rebut? <laughs> you know, if you want the paper to be taken seriously and carefully, it takes more than you know, eight hours to um, make a decision about whether um, we made a mistake. Um, if the revision is invited, you need to respond to the reviewers fully. If there's a major request for a new experiment that are not feasible or you feel strongly are not required, contact the editor for clarification before you go ahead and try to do the experiment or before you send the paper back without doing it. Because if it turns out that the editor and the reviewers disagree and you can't come to consensus on this, then you should send it somewhere else and not waste your time. Otherwise, you need to comply or at least address every comment made by the reviewer, even if it's to say that, you know, well, actually, you know, that prior paper didn't do this and it actually did that. Just go through every point. Don't just skip one because you didn't like it, because then the reviewer is going to be annoyed that you didn't um, address all the comments. And, you know, be succinct and be polite. No 20 page responses to reviewer comments. So the paper's accepted. You're really happy, but that's not the end of the process. Um, you know, the galley proofs, which are the actual PDFs that are going to be typeset and be on the website and be in the journal, are really important because that's the last chance you have to make sure something is correct and right. So take those seriously. I, I, the journal sends these things out that says you have to return in 48 hours or the world ends. That's not true. It's much better to take 96 hours or take two weeks if you have to because the person that you need to talk to to have it proofread with you is out of town or, you know, it really... I don't know of a situation with a journal other than maybe co-publication with another paper or an issue where they're putting bundling papers together on one topic where it ever is really an emergency to get the page proofs back immediately. It's much better to take time and make sure they're correct because you don't want to miss a problem and later have to publish a correction because frankly nobody ever looks at the corrections. So if it's wrong in the paper, it's always going to be wrong and it's going to be confusing when people present something at Journal Club to find out the axes were reversed or it's very embarrassing as blood editor every once in a while when that happens and they're presenting in Journal Club and it's like there's a mistake. It's like, oh God, we should have caught that. Well, the author should have caught it too. Um, Authorship should be negotiated in advance. Um, it's much better now because the software notifies every author at the time of submission that their paper has come in, that a paper has come in with their name on it. So if they were sixth author instead of fifth author, and that really makes a difference to them, they can contact the corresponding author or they can try to contact the journal, at which point we say, go away. You know, if you guys don't know who the authors are and what your authorship list is, we'll send the paper back to you. We will not intervene. That is not our problem. I had people call me at home and on my cell phone, and, but I really should have been first author. It's like, that may be true, but it's not nothing I can do anything about. So you need to negotiate this in advance. Sharing of publication-related materials. I already talked about the uh, you know, gene expression profiling and other data sets, but if you've made a new reagent, a monoclonal antibody, a transgenic mouse, you can't say, no, I won't give it out because I'm still doing our experiments. And, oh, no, I won't give it to you because you're a competitor. You have to finish that stuff that you're really worried about competition with before you get the paper accepted, not, not after. And we get into all kinds of fights about this. And we have sometimes banned authors from publishing in the journal subsequently if they you know, don't go along with what they agreed to in the first place by submitting that they would share uh, reagents. The same goes for disclosing a structure or a sequence of a new compound or drugs. Um, conflict of interest, we focus on disclosure. We want all authors to, um, to have access to the entire set of primary clinical data. We want to avoid undisclosed ghost writers or medical writers. It's fine to use a medical writer, but they have to be disclosed. We have to say who's paid for them. Um, and we, at least at Blood, have had the policy that for review articles and perspectives and how I treat, we do not allow any payment for, of medical writers or authors by pharmaceutical companies, because um, we feel that those are synthetic, subjective pieces that are supposed to be telling you how to decide which of the literature is, is the best for you and your patients, and that shouldn't involve any conflict of interest from pharmaceutical companies. So if you do all this right, this is where you'll be in another uh, 20 years. Okay, thank you all.